Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion on exploring microsampling, brought to you by Bioanalysis Zone. My name is Ayan Ali and I am an editor for Future Science Group, publisher of the journal Bioanalysis. As part of our feature on exploring microsampling, today we bring you a live panel discussion in which our experts will discuss the findings of our recent survey on the changing attitudes to microsampling and also address what the progress for the field means for the community. We will also be opening up the discussion to today's audience, so if you have any questions, please submit them during the course of the webinar using the Q&A tool in the right-hand side of the console. Questions will be addressed at the end of the discussion and then followed up online at Bioanalysis Zone, which is also where you'll find a recording of today's event. Joining us today are five experts within the microsampling field. Firstly, I would like to introduce Neil Spooner, Director and Founder of Spooner Bioanalytical Solutions, who will be your host for today's event. Hi, Neil. Hi there. Uh, we also have Craig Orand, Innovation Manager at Sigma Aldrich. Hi, Craig. Hello. And Roger Hayes, Senior Vice President, DMPK at MPI Research. Hi, Roger. Hello. James Rudge, Global Microsampling Specialist at Neoterix. Hi, James. Hello. And finally, Tim Sangster. And lastly, we have Tim Sangster, Head of Bioanalysis and Immunology at Charles Rivers Laboratories. Hi, Tim. Hi there, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today, everyone. I would now like to hand over to Neil, who will lead today's panel discussion. Thank you. Um, so let's get going on. I just want to talk about the changing landscape in, in the field, first of all. Um, the survey tells us that uh, there's been an increasing uptake in microsampling. I just wondered whether anyone had an opinion as to why there might have been this increase in uptake in microsampling since the last survey in uh, two years ago. Yeah, so this is uh, Roger Hayes. Um, what we've seen is a, a better understanding um, of some of the um, techniques that are available for microsampling. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about VAMs uh, and the availability of devices that really facilitate. I think the, uh, the days of dry blood spots um, uh, were, were limiting um, our ability to perform that in, at least in that um, early regulated space that we do at MPI. Um, so I think with the VAMS technology, um, the awareness and availability of that has really seen um, us pick up the, uh, the technology a bit, uh, a bit more than, um, say, two years ago. Does anyone else have any opinions on, on why the uptake may have uh, accelerated recently? Yeah, hi, Neil. This is Craig. Yeah, I, I think... In terms of the uptake, I mean, there had been so much work done the years prior, a lot of publications, uh, a lot of the, the background work had been uh, conducted through dry blood spots. So there was a lot of learnings from that stage uh, to showing really the, the potentials um, that DBS had to offer for microsampling. And it was just a, a natural progression to see the development of new technologies uh, taking those learnings from DBS and now be able to have uh, more devices that are available uh, that be able to show that utility. And now it opens up uh, new opportunities for, for customers to be able to start looking uh, at real uh, viable uh, solutions using microsampling. Cool. Thank you, Craig. Anyone else have any thoughts on that at all? Hi. Yes, no, this is on you go. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, uh, James Rudge. Um, I think it's it's a case of um, all of what everyone said, but uh, the, the more publications, the more people are presenting, the more people are, are producing posters um, about about uh, microsampling. More confidence is giving people to to venture forth into that into that space. So it becomes almost like a snowball effect. Yeah. Hi, it's Tim here. I, I was going to say very similar. I think just the um, weight of evidence almost of information that's out there. Um, some of the kind of key opinion leaders that have kind of started the microsampling discussion um, back sort of almost 10 years ago now 
um, and moving that through and just it's starting to gain momentum. People are starting to talk about it and, and starting to understand the impact it has to their drug development programs and some of the fears have been allayed in terms of either technical issues with the actual sampling or analysis issues on the back end. Yeah, yeah, I think they're all really good points. And I, I really like the piece around um, good quality publications. I think that really does make a difference. I, you know, I think we can all um, read things on, on companies' websites and things, but those peer-reviewed publications really help to move the agenda forwards and, and make something solid, and, and particularly when all the publications then support and agree with that. Right. Yeah, so Tim and I are, you know, both in that contract research area where, you know, it's the sponsors that have to place the work. They have to have confidence um, that their, their work um, or their important study isn't being compromised. And so the more um, the industry um, is making this a, um, you know, a decent and, and, and viable approach to doing bioanalysis, and that's where that peer-reviewed, it's always good to be able to reference a sponsor to, to a journal article. There's just the confidence that gains, and as, you, as um, was said earlier, there was a snowball effect. And so we're seeing, we're not having to sell through something as being new and unique, um, but it's just becoming more and more established, uh, and folks will look at that as a viable option rather than saying, well, why should I do something that's new and the risk that might be associated with it? Yeah, but there's also, I, sorry, Neil, it's, there's, also a, there's also a kind of requirement issue as well. As, as, as people start to hear about it, they start to think about what impact it has and how they can use it to design their, design their program. You know, many, many times do we design a toxicology program or a clinical program and the endpoints we're looking to take are limited by the blood volume or limited by some other parameters. But again, with microsampling, it takes the, the blood volume off the table. So we're actually seeing, as Roger said, it comes from our sponsors driving it, really. But also it comes from us saying, you know, having the confidence to say, well, you know, you can do that if you use microsampling. You'll also be able to get all these other endpoints. So there is, there is, there is a balance, and it is starting, to, as I say, the, the, the body of evidence is starting to get the discussion out there, which is then allowing... The, the kind of movement of the change curve uh, on the upward slope, so people are actually starting to gain momentum with microsampling, and it, uh, some of it is being um, need driven by the fact is that you know um, we we lack volume sometimes you know with animal ethics we can only take so much out of an animal it really is starting to change it in that direction as well for, in the favour of doing more and more microsampling. So just leading on from that, Roger and Tim, in, in as CROs, are you seeing? more the growth in microsampling being in the preclinical or the clinical area? Uh, well, preclinical for sure. Um, and it really does becomes um, study, I mean, study by study, case by case on the clinical side. You know, Tim's mentioned the endpoint and the blood volume for doing pediatrics. There is the opportunity now to do something. Um, but we've seen, it's been typically you know, late discovery as they are figuring out is this viable for regulated safety assessment um, because there's so many endpoints that they now want to do. The clinical medicine group are going crazy with all the biomarkers that what's left over is just drips and drabs for the for bioanalysis. So, um, you know, the uptake is, is late discovery and then it's sort of leading in uh, into that regulated space. For me, I think the, the, key, the key point is whether you're looking at um, liquid microsampling or solid microsampling. In the preclinical space, liquid microsampling is it's a, it's, a, it's a much more acceptable way of going forward because we're basically taking um, plasma or serum um, or blood and you know, those are standard traditional matrices that we're used to submitting to our regulators and they're used to seeing and the data has you know, we have background data we can relate to. Um, moving into the clinical space, taking, a, taking 10 microliters of plasma or a mill of plasma, it doesn't have that as much impact on standard clinical. Pediatrics and geriatric studies, it can have huge benefits. But on standard clinical studies, you know, phase one, phase two, it really doesn't give us too much benefit. The benefit in the clinical really comes when we can go to solid matrices, where we can then, you know, ship dried samples without having um, dry ice, but also we can go to, you know, remote monitoring, home monitoring, and all the other things that that gains advantages. So there is, there is that kind of balancing act. The other thing is some of the dried sampling techniques 
can be much simpler for sample collection. So when you're going to clinics, it can be much easier to adapt, whereas the liquid microsampling approaches tend to be a little bit more, um, maybe esoteric would be a good word, which you know animal units are very comfortable dealing with, but maybe going into some of the later clinics after phase one could be a bit more challenging. So you know there is there is that difference between microsampling, whether it's solid or liquid. I think. Right. No, that's a yeah. great point, Tim. Yeah, because the the concept of dried sample, uh, certainly in the preclinical space, you know, Tim's absolutely spot on. You know, the small samples are, are predominantly liquid, uh, but in that, but we are seeing a bit of that uptick in the discovery for the solid. Um, or the dried um, sample, but by far and above it is the small liquid samples um, that we're seeing in the regulated space. Yeah. That's interesting. So, um, Craig and, and James, uh, from from the other end, rather than being users, being manufacturers and selling these devices, are you seeing most of your change being in preclinical or the clinical environment for your technologies? Uh, it's, it's both, Neil, uh, from our from our um, perspective, um, and uh, you, you know we, we've seen quite, quite a, a, a kind of spread of, uh, of of people using the, the technology. Probably um, more so clinical, but certainly in preclinical as well. And I think in a couple of the areas which um, we've been um, uh, this is really quite interested in is is, is um, both used for um, for pediatrics as, uh, as Tim mentioned and there's, there's, there really is a drive uh, in the industry to uh, to uh, or in, in in medical science to, is to try and understand um, how to treat and monitor uh, children a lot better and, and get medicines that are more specific for them and and obviously, you know, sampling from a finger prick is a lot more appealing um, than it is uh, taking a blood draw. The second area, which is uh, which is of, of great interest, and that's um, um, therapeutic drug monitoring, specifically also for medical adherence. Uh, there, there appears to be quite an issue uh, with medical ad adherence. Um, um, people are not taking their medicines enough, and uh, this is a really good way to help uh, people uh, uh, take their medicine. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah Neil, sorry, so, sorry. I mean, I'd say in, in terms from from our standpoint, too, it, it is very similar. Um, a lot of the interest has been in the preclinical field uh, areas to be able to uh, really start to employ uh, some of the benefits for, for microsampling. Uh, the multiple sampling uh, of, of rodents has been uh, of a major of interest uh, from our standpoint. Um, but there has been uh, clinical interest also. Uh, similarly with uh, the TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring, uh, the ability to start uh, to be able to do not only uh, micro sampling but multiple sampling uh, with these small devices uh, has gained some interest again in terms of monitoring whether or not uh, you know, patients are, are taking, uh, taking the medications um, and it, it's, it's, it is, it's a growing area. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So. Um we, have we seen a big change compared to a few years ago when um, you know, there, there was that um, concern when the regulators were requesting in, in the clinical field for drug development that both a, a wet and a dry sample was taken and, and that caused a lot of people to back off from what were dry blood spots at the time. Have the sort of noises coming from the regulators and the technologies that are now available helped us to move on past that. So do you think we're past that problem? Huh. Well, the, you know, as, as Tim and I mentioned earlier, the, the, the small liquid sample, there is no issue and there's no regulatory concern because that's just considered liquid. The VAMS um, has definitely improved um, our ability to deal with the issues that the regulators were bringing up. Um, so there is a way to sell through the, um, the regulatory concern. Um, regulators are becoming, you know, they just, anytime they get more and more data in these peer uh, reviewed journal publications have gone a long way to giving them confidence. Um, there's still reluctance, you know, from some, some of our sponsors to say, well, why, why do I really need to to do this because will it put my package um, at submission time um, at risk? So I have not done a lot of the um, 
the early phase one work, uh, it really has to be case by case to say, you know, we've talked, you know, talked about the home sampling. That's where um, the VAMs and those devices, dried blood spots, I'm not sure we'll ever get past the implications of hematocrit issues and things like that, not until we've got a lot more data. Um, and, I, and I would say I haven't done a dry blood spot sample in probably two years. Yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts around that? Yeah, I think, hi Neil, it's Tim again. Um, I think the key is that, you know, the liquid sampling is gaining a lot of traction. Um, the regulated bodies are really, in preclinical species, they're looking for the exposure measurements taken by, you know, the pharmacokinetic TK analysis we do to be directly related to the toxicology. And so by having the microsampling, they're seeing a huge benefit in that space. And I think, and I'm hoping that, you know, the use of liquid microsampling gaining traction in preclinical will start to kind of open up the eyes and make people a bit more comfortable dealing with microsampling, which may then allow us to look more seriously at things like VAMs. But I think in terms of clinical, I'm not aware of anybody having got or made any submissions with VAMs for clinical approval as yet. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that'll be the big water sh watershed. But I think we're going to get there, but it's just going to be a little bit slower because we're going to have to get the acceptance of microsampling in the liquid form more and more um, accepted by regulators and by our, our, our colleagues in the pharmaceutical companies so that, that becomes de rigueur, and that is the standard approach. And once we're doing that, then it, it's a little less of a jump to then go to solid sampling. Um, and I think the regulators might start to come along with it a little bit, a little bit faster in that space once we've kind of proven the technology and everything else just in the analysis of the small samples a little bit more than we have done so far. But really, it's just about getting that acceptance and getting people used to it. Right. Yeah, makes sense. So we seem to be moving on to. Um, part two of the conversation now, so I'm just going to pause it, and uh, and then we can re restart, okay? Okay. Yep. Okay, so I, I think that conversation brought us naturally on to what, what are the major challenges for adoption of, of microsampling by companies and academics? Has anyone got some thoughts on that? Yeah, so again, just focus on the preclinical, which most folks think of, you know, with the three R's and trying to reduce animal use. Um, the thought of using microsamp is obviously a very natural fit, um, but it's not so much just the bioanalytical. Um, there's a lot of other endpoints being taken that require blood volume. So I'm really speaking about uh, the clinical medicine and the, uh, the ClinPath uh, endpoints. Um, so there's been a lot of work in developing biomarkers. But the clinical analyzers, you know, they may have originally been developed for humans where blood volume is not necessarily a, uh, a huge part of the, of the equation. But when you use those clinical analyzers uh, in the preclinical space, the blood volumes are still pretty high. So having satellite animals um, disappear when you're using, if your only endpoint is, um, you know, toxicokinetics, um, it, it's brilliant for using a micro sample, whether it be liquid or, um, or solid form. Um, but there's still this need for uh, ClinMed to have their blood volume. So satellite animals go back on study and, and we've kind of lost the advantage of um, taking, you know, fewer animals um, on study. Um, now, obviously, with the largest species, um, it's, it's always been accepted that um, you know, a, you know, a, a primate or a dog, there's plenty of blood, well, there's plenty of sufficient blood volume to get what you need. But where we were really hoping um, is to impact the uh, the rodents and being able to do serial sampling. Um, but what we've seen is our clean medical uh, folks are trying to uh, still collect these large volumes, but in the discovery or late discovery, when we are doing um, only PK endpoints, now we're really starting to uh, realize the benefit of you know, much smaller volumes and serial sampling, the data quality goes up. Are you seeing that as well, Tim? Mm, sort of different for us. Um, one of the things we've done is within the company, within Charles River, we've done a lot of work on looking at the study design. 
Um, as I said, one of the drivers for us is to really get the exposure and the toxicology from the same animal. And exactly as Roger said, the, the clinical chemistry is, is, a, is a major major limitation because the volumes you use for hematology, etc., are can be quite quite large volumes that you need to use. And if you're using, particularly in the mouse, it can be really challenging. So we've come up with some really unique composite designs where we take um, exposure from our main study animals and we have additional main study animals rather than having a satellite group and that allows us to kind of tie everything together. So we may not be able to get a six, seven, eight time point profile out of a, out of a single animal from the main group, but we can certainly get you know two, three TK samples from that group. So we're reducing down the variability in our data and that's been very, very useful for us and that's worked pretty well for us. Mm. Right. But one of, the challenge, one of the challenges with that has been that if we start taking our TK from our main study animals, does the actual sampling start to impact and generate the toxicology? And so there was some work done by AstraZeneca in the UK looking, looking at that, and there's, there's quite a nice publication out there on that from them that they saw really no impact from it. Um, you know, so the other thing is you can we've we've looked at having you know your control group having them sampled as well, so that there's if there's any toxicology coming from the sampling technique, you can see it in your control group. So it, there is definitely a challenge around that taking from your main study animals. Are you impacting on the toxicology? But say there is an AstraZeneca publication out there which is very good in this space, and also we've come up with some unique designs ourselves to kind of allay fears that that is causing a problem. Yeah, I agree. There's been quite a lot of data now from AstraZeneca and some posters and papers from, from other groups as well showing that uh, there may be some minimal impact on, on hematology, et cetera, and, and maybe if uh, your toxicology endpoints are related closely to that, you, you maybe need to go back to satellites, but uh, just giving us a lot of reassurance that you're not going to affect other toxicology endpoints. Um, yeah. I, something I for, for go on, go on, sorry, Tim. Sorry, I think, I think you raise a really good point there, Neil, is the fact is that um, microsampling is a technique, it's a tool. It's not going to be the answer to every single assay and every single problem we run and every study we run. You know, if, if, if you are running um, general toxicology oral, then, you know, your average microsampling is going to work really, really well for you. If you're looking at something like an inhalation program where you're not looking for systemic exposure or a dermal toxicity study where you're dosing onto the skin and you're not looking for a systemic exposure, then, you know, you've got to be really challenged that are you doing everything you can to generate um, systemic exposure data? And so then microsampling can be quite challenging in those areas. It doesn't stop us. We've done a couple of those. Um, but it, it can be more challenging in those space, and you may have to go back into traditional macro sampling and, you know, potentially into satellite groups. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Tim. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people often think, you know, if, if we do micro sampling, whether it be in preclinical or clinical, do we have to do it for everything? And my answer always is no, you, it's a tool. You use the best tool to answer the question that you've got at hand. And if that's microsampling, go for it. But if, if if it's a normal volume sample for whatever reason, then you should use that. You should use whatever gives you the best quality data to answer the question you've got. Right. Yeah, it was very interesting, Roger, earlier saying he hasn't done a DBS sample for quite a long time. Yeah. We, we, we still do a lot, but, but we're not doing it for pharmaceutical research. We're doing it for agrochemical research, and, you know, particularly looking at the avian models where, um, we're taking samples that not in a laboratory, shall we say. So um, DBS has a really strong space um, in certain applications, the same as microsampling is, is good in its, in its use if it meets the requirements you need for the study. Hmm. That's very interesting. So um, just um, one here to bring Craig and James in a little bit is, to me, one of the big issues around microsampling is obviously those small volumes make it tricky for the bioanalytical scientists, both, both um, you know, in actually handling the samples and in automating the workflows. And we would got somewhere with some technologies for dry blood spots. A lot of companies came out with automated approaches for looking at, for analyzing those samples. But obviously, as DBS is dying off, they're of less use. Um, just any thoughts around bioanalytical workflows and whether, whether that's a blocker for a lot of adaptation for, for companies? 
Yeah, Neil, this is Craig. So I think that's one area that you know we've seen and, and noticed in, in talking with uh, the collaborators we work with in terms of the quality of data that's generated. Uh, so even though it is a micro sample, uh, in most cases, even if it's just a, an accurate volume of, of blood that's collected, it's still requiring a, a degree of sample preparation and sample cleanup before the uh, the uh, the following um, LCMS analysis. So there's, there can be, uh, we've had some feedback about the limitations or some issues about the small volume of blood and the ability to be able to get the sensitivity levels that they're looking for for certain applications. Um, and it, certainly I think that's something that, you know, is, uh, that could be a challenge for, for the bioanalytical scientists. Um, those are things that can be addressed uh, with some of the new devices that we see on the market to be able to help uh, do either its in situ sample cleanup or, or to be able to make it more readily automatable, um, but and how to handle those smaller volumes. But that's been uh, you know some of the feedback in terms of you know we have the small sample, we still aren't really comfortable with having a really good cleanup method that's going to drive the sensitivity of the assay. Mm. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree. Yeah, I think I think this, this is James. Yeah, I, um, I agree. I think that that, um, uh, that it's, it's, it's all to do with assay. Uh, basically, how specific you are with the assay, um, and, and, and it's assay driven, instrument um, driven as well. There's been some amazing advances in, should we say, mass spec technology uh, over the last sort of decade or so, a couple of decades or so. So it's really allowing for um, assays to be used for micro sampling now, but you know, some some years ago it would be impossible to do so. So I think that um, as as technology improves, um, more and more um, assays can be can be uh, used for micro sampling. I think then it sort of kind of boils down to a, um, a confidence to go in and try something that's, that's brand new, and then try try different extraction methodologies to to try and get the best and the most consistent. Um, sample you can get, and if it's a blood micro sample, it's considering things like hematocrit and and how to uh, overcome any any issues that might be there. So, do you think we'll we'll see convenient automation for micro samples at all? Are, are people using automation at the moment? Is that a barrier? I I, I think the interesting barrier is the transition between the sample collection portion. Uh, and then the migration with the instrumentation. So certainly um, there are devices on the market uh, that are fully automatable using liquid robotic handling systems, um, but it's that tie-in to from sample collection to get that into the workflow, to get it fully automated. I think there's still areas where there can be improvements to really enable the customers to gain the, the true benefit uh, of micro-sampling through, you know, through automation. Right. Yeah. So this is. Yeah. Really yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, with these um, liquid micro samples, certainly in the preclinical space, um, tr manipulating that um, to get that um, tiny aliquot into a let's say a 96 plate format, um, that is actually more challenging than to be able to have an individual cryovial with you know 100 or 200 microliters in it. Um, but once you get it into the 96 plate format, that that liquid droplet, um, or even for that matter, a VAMS um, nib, um, going through the automated liquid processing, and that's just straight into the usual uh, workflow. Uh, what we found is the the solid um, devices are even are much easier to manipulate than trying to fiddle around with. Um, you know, tiny volumes in the bottom of a um, of a capillary or in a, in a tube with a capillary, um, and and getting that into that 96 plate format um, has oftentimes uh, led to lost samples. Uh, whereas just to be able to uh, pluck off a nib from uh, from one of the VAMS devices and drop it into a 96 has been actually quite uh, quite reasonable. Okay, so going around the analytical piece again. Is, uh, are most of you finding that um, reaching the kind of assay ranges and particularly the lower limits of quantification with the kind of precision and accuracy you would expect from normal um, blood volumes and plasma volumes, uh, is our microsamples causing a problem with those low limits of quantification? Yeah, Ken, so this is Roger again. Um, 
Not necessarily. Um, you know, we've been doing microsampling in the talk space for well over a decade because the drug levels are, mu are substantially higher. When we talk about the um, biologic therapeutics, uh, we're already used to uh, very low, you know, picogram levels for our LBA assays, and in fact, you're often diluting the sample uh, down, you know, one to ten, one to a hundred uh, for the minimum required dilution to get the assay within range. So we've not really struggled in the preclinical. Uh, clinical is a different story. Um, now you're talking about therapeutic drug levels, um, oftentimes in those sub picogram levels, and blood volume does become important uh, for assay sensitivity. Okay. So, a question for whoever wants to field it, really. How much is training important in all of this, whether it be of the person collecting the sample or the person analyzing the sample? Um, this is James. I think it's absolutely critical, actually. I mean, uh, part of what it is I do is to go into to labs and help train um, uh, use on, on, on the particular microsampling um, device that we, uh, that we work, work with. Um, it's really important uh, to, you know, to to train the, the scientists, but also those collecting as well. I think uh, to make sure they get a good sample, um, um, and uh, so people get used to using using uh, these devices, and it's, it's important. Hi, Neil. Hi, it's Tim here. One of the things I would say is the training is actually more important for me on the people designing the studies. It's, um, you know, most of the studies that are not designed, they're not designed by bioanalytical people, they're designed by toxicologists or clinicians, and getting them to understand what microsampling can do for them um, and give them the confidence to use it, that's been one of the biggest challenges we certainly faced is, you know, getting that acceptance in people when they're kind of putting a study to, together to kind of consider microsampling as, a, as, as the main approach and, you know, and how to utilize it. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Getting people to change the way they've always done things when the main focus of what they're wanting to do is run their study and get their data. They, yeah. they don't want to put that at risk. Right. So it's always yeah, a we, we yeah, we actually, I, Tim, again, we, we got very little resistance from the uh, animal staff that we work with, the people who actually handle the animals and take the samples. They were actually very encouraged, whether it's been by originally doing dry blood spots or capillary microsampling or even looking at things like the VAMS devices. These guys have been really engaged and really committed to it because they see the advantages to the animals that they're handling on a daily basis. Right. So where has, where has been your hardest sell then? You know, has it been clinical people, biological people, management? Um, sponsors. Um, <laughs> exactly as you said, they want to get their data, they want to get their study through, they don't want to have any concerns. And if you run it the way you ran it last year uh, and that went through the regulators, why, why would it not go through again? Um, so trying to show the advantages and benefits and trying to find those unique selling points of microsampling to get them to move and to, to kind of start that change moving. And that, that's been the hardest thing is getting that momentum. And I was saying by the body of evidence and everything else that's happening in the industry at the moment, we're starting to see more and more sponsors are coming to us and saying, right, well, what if we use the study? What if we do microsampling? What if we do it that way? Um, so it's starting to gain momentum now. Yeah, okay. this is Roger again. So this is absolutely correct, Tim. You know, it's it's the sponsors where you have to sell through something. I mean, you really, uh, at the better it becomes accepted, no longer are you trying to convince them that this is in their best interest. It should just be a natural flow to say, oh, well, okay, we don't need to have as many animals. It's going to save you money. Um, or you're going to, re you know, reduce the requirement for, you know, satellite animals and a rodent study and things like that. So the, I mean, the challenge of having to sell through something and saying, well, it's okay to do this, um, I wish that went away. Uh, large farmer have very much um, have adopted the concept. In fact, they will come to us and say, have you got microsampling experience? But we, you know, MPI does a lot of work with these tiny uh, biotechs, you know, less than five people companies, and their conservatism, uh, and when you say, well, look, we're going to try something called microsampling, well, you just don't do that because um, it'll frighten them off and say, well, why don't you do it the way that everybody else does it? Well, they, everybody else is doing microsampling. Um, becomes a much easier sell. Yeah, yeah. So I think this gives us a, a, a natural move on to the next slide. So I'm just going to move the slide on to the future. Um, there just may be a slight pause while that happens. Um, okay, so just wondering what 
you all thought of where microsampling might be going? Um, you know, how how microsampling might look in five or ten years' time? Is it going to be across the board? Is it going to be niche? Is it going to be the same as it is now? Or is it going to be very different? Hmm. Again, so this is this is Roger again. Um, if, with the um, the portfolios of drug candidates coming through, switching more and more to biologics. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where microsampling will fit in that. You know, the small liquid samples um, and you know dried blood spots and techniques like that were originally focused around LCMS, although there were certainly LBA assays being done. But when you're doing a a biologic, um, there is this need to do multiple samples because you'll have your PK assay, and then you'll have your anti drug antibody, and you might even have an AB assay for immunogenicity. Um, being able to take small aliquots, um, lots of aliquots will certainly help. Uh, it'll just be curious to see, you know, you know when you start seeing the, the uh, peer-reviewed publications around um, analyte stability, will a biologic maintain activity um, on a, you know, in a dried format? Um, will the cell-based NAB assay actually behave? Um, how will a um, an ADA um, you know, an IgG, will it be stable? There's a lot of um, unknown there, and, and so really um, there's a great opportunity for, you know, for the research to, to, to come along, uh, and I would hope that where we are today with LCMS is the same place uh, where we might be in a couple of years, um, you know, with, uh, with the biologics. Now, clearly with liquid samples and small volumes, I mean, the you know, gyro workstations, we're doing nanoliters of samples. We're already there for instrument sensitivity. So I don't think that will be anything that will hinder the advancement and, and more rapid pickup, um, you know, to take a dig at, um, at suppliers. If the costs of the uh, materials comes down, um, then I, I think you'd see even a quicker uptake because Tim and I have to sell to sponsors that there might be an upcharge if you use this uh, technique. Um, and they'll say, well, why don't you just do it by ELISA or something, um, you know, to keep the costs down. So I think with volume, clearly there's going to be some market leverage um, in, in constraining costs. Thank you, Roger. Anyone else thoughts where, where we're going with microsampling? This is James. Um, in, in, a, in the future, I think for, for uh, in the clinical space, um, um, there, there is a, there's this sort of emergence of personalised medicine, uh, where uh, people, in a sense, will have their sort of phenome or genome or both scanned uh, to to figure out what the best treatment regime is for that uh, that individual. And I think that um, certainly being able to take that information from one drop of blood and then have that sent to a laboratory for analysis on a fancy mass spectrometer uh, is really appealing um, and that that could be done from a remote setting and then sent in. So I think that uh, in, in that area, I think that we could see a, a growth in microsampling. So do you see that moving closer to the consumer, James? From yeah, I think, I, I think so. I think that, that people are starting to become more and more um, in charge of their own their own health in a sense uh, you know if you see the number of people now who've got sort of wrist watches which can monitor pulse rate and how many steps they're taking and, 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 and monitor how, how you know how fit they're becoming or unfit they're becoming people are starting to become a lot more aware of their of their of their own health and I think that uh, in a sense uh, being able to take uh, take uh, take charge of your own uh, monitoring of, 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 of biomarkers if a, if a person's got a, uh, an illness um, it helps people being to be a lot more engaged in their own treatment. So I think that, that, that things are moving in that, in that direction, certainly. Um, and do you think we'll, um, by 10 years from now, with, with some of the, I mean, the regulators aren't blocking microsampling. In fact, you know, in the preclinical area, they're actively encouraging it. In the yeah. clinical area, they're saying, you know, if you do got a dry sample, we want a comparison to a conventional wet sample. Do you think that that reluctance, that those extra tests in the regulated arena, will be gone away in ten years' time, or will we still be doing that? 
Well, I would think that, again, this is Roger, so I would think by 2020, um, most of the regulatory concern should have dissipated, um, at least within the, uh, the US FDA. Um, I think the body of evidence is definitely building. And then as the um, drug targets become more and more into the ultra rare or oncology with where you're trying to hunt down patients to be able to, you know, the, the whole mechanics of collecting samples, um, you know, the home, home based um, um, collections and things like that will facilitate the, the data that's going to come in to get these unmet medical needs met. Um, and, you know, I think the VAMs and the dried blood spots is, is, is going to be a facilitator and certainly by, within 10 years there should have, there, there must be enough data by now to, to suggest that there really isn't any, anything untoward uh, from, a, from just basically a different collection um, methodology. That's good news, Roger. Anyone mm. else have any I thoughts around that? Yeah, hi, it's Tim here. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give the opposite opinion to Roger. <laughs> I, I I think I think that I think in ten years time I think we'll be moving forward, but I don't think we're gonna be where we want to be. I think you know as Roger pointed out, um, TDM therapeutic drug monitoring is gonna help us gain um, massive weight behind the solid matrix approach. But again, I don't think we're gonna get regulatory acceptance for it for a variety of reasons unless as an industry we do something concerted to solve it and in order to, to change the perception. I think the perception will change slowly over time by the use of it in, um, in situations where there isn't a choice or in situations where it adds huge value to the program. But in our standard clinical arena where we're doing phase one, phase two, you know, clinical setting where we're getting a drug to market in a standard traditional um, therapy area, I think we're going to struggle to get away from that solid versus liquid. You know, liquid samples have been used for a long time. We as an industry are incredibly conservative, not just the regulators, but our clients and our companies that we work for are very, very conservative. I think unless there's a dramatic mind shift, we're not going to move to solid matrices other than unique um, home-based monitoring or you know, even third world countries where you don't have access to centrifuges and fridges and freezers easily. So the use of, you know, solid matrices becomes really valuable in those spaces. And that will gain weight and it will get more and more used and more utilized that gets more evidence. But I think as an industry to get it accepted, we're going to have to do something. You know, the micro sampling in the preclinical arena, I think, is going to gain a huge amount of traction. And I think in 10 years time, I hope it will be the, the daily standard approach for an assay. It will be macro sampling and using satellite groups will be the, the unusual situation. And that will also help gain evidence and start to build things going through. But I think as an industry, I think we have to have some kind of industry consortium to look at the use of solid matrices again now that we've got new technologies coming out. I mean, VAMS isn't the only one, but there are others out there. Um, and when that, that happens, I think we have to have another industry consortium process, uh, approach, you know, whether it's through APS or EBF, we need something to really gain traction and gain that, you know, for the standard clinical pharmaceutical work we do, I think we need to do something. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think there is already a lot of that going on. European Bioanalysis Forum have been doing a lot, bringing companies together to, to do experiments together and, and publish that. And the AAPS have just formed a, a, a new group following on from the success of what the IQ Consortium did. And I, I think those things are really, really powerful, bringing together companies from, you know, to just move the technology forwards together. Mm. Yeah, I really think that is where we're going to see that um, change. But it, it is going to take something that we're going to have to, as an industry, do, I think, to get really get it fully accepted, particularly in the clinical phase. Right. Yeah, this is Craig. I mean, I agree. I mean, even if we look at in terms of the adoption of mass spectrometry, even from from a clinical standpoint, I mean, that's really just starting to take phase now, um, where before everybody was very comfortable using ELISA kits. Um, so that progression of mass spectrometry, which is clearly uh, a much superior uh, type of analysis. So I think it's going to take those consortiums to really demonstrate to show the true benefit of microsampling, and it comes down to the quality of data uh, that's being generated, uh, the, the data that's enabled to 
be provided to uh, the customers and, and what they're able to do with that. So it, it's going to take a, a mass uh, a shift uh, to really to get everybody to, to move forward with this. Yeah. So is there anything more positive we can all do to, to help make sure it, it does keep going and doesn't fall off the rails? Well, I think Tim had some ideas. Yeah. Well, this is Roger again. So the the concept of, of picking the case by case to use those types of studies to build that weight of evidence that then will push it into the into the normal uh, you know clinical development. Um, so we've seen a little bit of an uptick in ultra rare diseases, and then when folks are trying to chase down uh, patients, so there's more um, clinical. Uh, open clinical sites and there are actual patients available, um, that's where having the ability to identify a patient, it could well be in a third world country, whether it's just not the infrastructure to, um, to collect, um, you know, very, very quick samples or, or something like that. It'll be really a, a physician who sees a case and, oh, by the way, we'd like to, uh, to collect some samples to facilitate the, the drug development. Having you know, like a, a rack of, of VAM um, tips available or readily shipped goes a long way to, um, you know, helping develop that particular uh, therapeutic. Um, then that will, you know, just I would hope naturally evolve into, well, why don't we do a little bit more of, of that uh, in, in that traditional clinical development space. So moving back to bioanalytical, do you think the biological lab, due to microsampling, will look quite different in 10 years' time? Will the workflows be the same, just on a smaller scale? Or, or, or does some of the changes we've got here facilitate quite a different biological lab and therefore some different strategies around how bioanalysis is done? Mm -hmm. This is no, kind of, you know, I, I think, I mean, the area that we're seeing is, is the ability to uh, to do direct sampling. Uh, so we've we've had quite a bit of interest instead of even taking blood samples of doing direct in vivo sampling. Um, in terms of the workflow through the the animal technicians, um, this is a you know it's not a foreign technique. It seems to be very similar. But then in terms of the, the, the data that's generated, so we've, we've seen the differentiation where uh, customers have an interest in doing direct monitoring of the, the, free, the free circulating fraction uh, of a drug as compared to doing the assay and, and, and determining the total amount. Uh, so I think there's, there's some real interest there uh, in terms of how that workflow looks now. And, from sample collection and again the data that's generated and how that data is being you know used in determination for for the drug uh, itself I, I can see where that could potentially have a, a big shift in in the industry uh, and how they're they're interpreting the, the information yeah I, I I think I can see some very different workflows coming up in the future that could actually facilitate more automation in the bioanalytical lab um, becoming a, a more easy thing to do than it is at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Well, one of the, this is James. One of the areas that we're, we're quite interested in is the idea of being able to almost go from like, like barcode to data, and then, then let a, a robot and an instrument handle everything else. So, in a sense, put something onto a, a cartridge, onto a, onto, a, onto a robot, press go, and then it barcode scans that, and then and then the samples are then picked out extracted and then those extracts are then um, sent to a, to a mass spectrometer so the whole thing is, is, is controlled automatically. Mm -hmm. So do any of us see, you know, a lot of people talk about putting the bioanalytical laboratory closer to the patient, whether it be in the pharmacist, whether it be in the hospital or whatever, or the bedside, is, is that a real possibility? Mm -hmm. Well, in order to achieve the sensitivities um, with these microsamples, um, the portable mass spectrometer may not quite hit that uh, hit that requ um, that requirement. But uh, maybe 10 years from now, 
um, the sensitivity um, is achievable uh, on a bench, well, even a, a you know a benchtop uh, remote system. Uh, but I think for the moment, as we are as we're trying to push uh, sensitivities, whether it be an LBA assay or an LCMS assay, those instruments are pretty much uh, uh, plugged into uh, into large bioanalytical labs and, and not so much transportable. Yeah, indeed. Right, well, I think we're going to wrap up that section for now and we'll move on to Q&As now, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, so we've got some questions coming in here. Um, first one for you, James. Um, how did you become involved with microsampling? Yeah, it was back in uh, 2009. I was, I was at a... Um uh, conference and uh, I saw a presentation by a certain Neil Spooner um, on <laughs> red blood spot sampling and uh, I thought it was a really, really neat idea and a really great way to uh, to reduce the amount of, of uh, blood being used um, for, for sampling, reducing the amount of animals and all the other aforementioned benefits that we've discussed. Um, and um, when we were chatting uh, afterwards, uh, Neil and I, um, I was just chatting about that, some of the drawbacks of uh, of BBS, and one of those was the was, was the volumetric hematocrit bias, which is uh, an issue to do with the way in which blood spreads on paper as a result of its viscosity, which is re related to the amount of blood cells that are present in in the in the blood. And so I I, I sort of thought about it, and, and I and I thought to myself, well, perhaps there's a uh, a, a, an easier way to do this by by having a fixed volume sampler, and so I just kind of suggested that to to, to Neil. And he said that was a neat idea, so I went off and um, uh, developed some uh, prototypes and took those to Neil to to test. So that's where I when it came into the world of, of microsampling. That's a good story, James. And you know, people wouldn't believe how long it took to develop that technology. Really, I don't think it, it took a while. Yeah. So um, I'm widen that out to everyone else, you know, because uh, I think it's an interesting question. Craig, how, how did you become involved in the wonderful world that is microsampling? Yeah, so, I mean, I started out, I mean, background is in LCMS chromatographer and doing a lot of sample preparation and uh, so had been doing a lot of research in terms of devices for uh, plasma cleanup. And uh, it was through a collaboration that we were doing with a, a university. Um, we were looking at other devices that were doing for micro extraction. And uh, they came up with this idea to be able to have a device for direct biological sampling. So <clears throat> after the first couple months of investigating that technology and looking at it, it really looked like that, you know, there's, there could be potential to that. And so that was... Uh, about five years ago and still on this path and quite excited to see where it's going and, and, and how it's being utilized. Cool, cool. Tim, how did, how did you get involved? Oh, I'm going to go way back. Um, back in the 1990s, um, I started in bioanalysis in about 1995, I think. Um, one of the things I saw was my mass specs getting more and more sensitive and it kind of made me think, why, why am I not using this to, to take lower volumes from my animals and, you know, take less sample volumes so I'm actually, you know, being more ethical with the animals and also uh, freeing up blood volumes for other assessments to allow us to be more accurate in our studies. So I kind of started back then trying to figure out how to do it. And to be honest, never really figured out how to do it back then. I looked at the Starstead microvets back in the 1990s. They seem to be about the only device out there. Um, really struggled to get traction from some of my colleagues within the toxicology units as well. Um, but again, I was um, then I stayed on that as a kind of a topic of interest for many years, um, and I was very lucky to uh, meet Ove Johnson at a meeting in Philadelphia um, in about 2009, and then that's where I kind of started getting really engaged into the capillary microsampling and the liquid liquid sampling, um, and that's where, you know, we'd spend quite a lot of time doing that now within uh, Charles River. Thank you, Tim. And, and Roger? Yeah, so much like Tim, it did start in the 90s um, with, uh, actually for me it was in the discovery space, 
because it was right about that time that folks figured out that uh, you could actually do PK uh, fairly quickly um, on these uh, magical devices called mass specs. And um, what actually happened is every damn medicinal chemist said, well, I would like to run my compound through that rat model. And so it really was out of necessity that we had to learn how to um, you know, handle very small um, volumes because we were dosing so many um, analytes um, that uh, you know the the vivarium staff were going going nuts. But uh, of course, on the bioanalytical side, um, it was really as the mass specs became more and more sensitive, uh, we were able to uh, to respond to that need. Um, it was the uh, the tension that was built up in the. Uh, the folks that actually had to bleed the animals, and we had to start the training and and putting in workflows for how to uh, collect these tiny samples. Uh, and so then that progressed probably with liquid microsampling for, gosh, well over a decade. And you know we just got better and better. Uh, instruments got uh, more and more sensitive. Um, but we're always struggling with the training of our uh, Clin Med people taking the uh, the blood samples. And so when the uh, these dried um, uh, uh, techniques came around and really facilitated um, their um, role of, uh, of obtaining that uh, um, blood sample. That's when it became, um, you know, much much more uh, desirable. Uh, and so then we're trying to sell it through uh, to the sponsors, saying we want to do everything this way. Um, so it's been a long uh, journey, and um, you know, it was certainly. Um, you know, out of necessity that we were we were trying to deal with these you know smaller and smaller volumes. Um, so it was quite a quite a fun and, uh, fun and exciting time. I'm glad you've had fun and excitement, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> for, for myself, I guess it goes back over over ten years. And and the company I was working at at the time, GlaxoSmithKline, were trying to figure out how we might support pharmacokinetics in pediatric studies because the <laughs> regulators were giving you an extra six month on patent life if you were able to register a pediatric medicine. So we were trying to figure that out and, and for working with really small children, the only way we really saw was um, dry blood spots. We, you know, we were aware of some publications from Merck and elsewhere that used dabbled around with it in the discovery um, preclinical area, but and obviously it had been in neonatal screening, but no one had really applied it to regulated bioanalysis and clinical samples. So that's where we started, and then we started to realize where it might help us preclinically and, and just in, in other areas as well, and, and my interest grew from there. And, and here I still am, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so we just move on. I've got another question here. Um, this one's from Craig. Um, so... How will the role of microsampling influence the future of analytical techniques? Are you okay to take that one, Craig? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good, Neil. So, I mean, that's just an interesting aspect. I mean, in terms of we, we've seen the, the progression uh, from DBS, uh, the advancement of the different platforms. Um, again, looking at that moving into the future, how do we really make that a seamless transition from sample collection to data generation? Uh, and so, you know, as we've all seen, the advancements of mass spectrometers, uh, they've become much more sensitive, much more specific. Uh, there's a natural progression to be able to meld that sample collection portion with uh, the mass spec for very rapid screening to be able to do qualitative, quantitative data generation. So I think that's an interesting area to see how the sample collection devices and techniques can then be married with you know, the, the mass spectrometers, whether it's still the, the very high-end systems that you would find in more of like a bioanalytical lab or purpose-built mass spectrometers that you could see in, say, maybe some of the clinical offices that allow that very rapid screening, uh, so you're getting t closer to that point of care type of data generation uh, to be able to very uh, much more accurately and, and expedited uh, assessment of that patient's uh, condition. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yes, this is Roger. So I think you know, the, the push in diagnostic, and we talked about you know doing PK endpoints and things like that, but I think the ability to take a sample, a blood sample, 
and do some more diagnostic testing, that will drive innovation uh, in the workflows around in, in the clinical medicine uh, arena. Now, you know, you could replace all the clinical analyzers with mass specs, that's an option, um, but you, you will see changes or advancements in those types of platforms. Now maybe, you know, the ELISA kits and things like that will continue to improve or actually now pick up again um, sort of a full circle because of the sen inherent sensitivity of that. But as people look to biomarkers that are available in systemic circulation um, to collect a blood sample in a patient's, you know, in a, in a doctor's office and then submit that for uh, diagnostic uh, uh, evaluation will drive um, a, you know, further um, development in those analytical tools. Yeah. And, and do you think those analytical tools will look the same? You know, if we're working with microsamples, do we need to work with LCMS in the way we are? Or, or, or should we be looking at a different paradigm for actually analyzing those samples? Should we just try be trying to ram them into the techniques we've got for large volume samples, or should we be looking at a different way of actually dealing with these small samples? If I can maybe uh, come in here, uh, Neil, I think from from my perspective, I think the the um, the, the um, increasing popularity of time of flight mass spectrometers and and, and orbit traps, where essentially you can get a lot more with a lot less. Um, is, is really very, very exciting in that, you know, talking about the picking up um, unique biomarkers or, or, or current biomarkers you know, from, from, one, from, one, uh, from one drop of blood. Uh, I think the, the challenge here is simply data, data storage, data security, and data manipulation. Um, yeah. You know, uh, getting that proverbial needle, uh, needle from, a, from, a, from a haystack, that's, that is the, uh, that's, that's, that's where I reckon the the next paradigm shift is going to be in, in being able to very rapidly elucidate from that data the information that, that, that is clinically relevant. Yeah. And just a personal observation, I, I kind of think that these new kind of samples and samplers and smaller volumes give us a new opportunity to, to rethink how we do our analysis and, and may have some, you know, we may do our ionization in different ways. We may do our separations in some very, very different ways mm. than we are doing currently with, with plain LCMS. But I, I think that's going to make, be made awkward, not by the, um, the regulators, but by ourselves. We've all invested and know about certain techniques like LCMS. We've spent millions of pounds, whether it be in pharmaceutical companies or in clinical chemistry labs, and they've spent millions of pounds on certain kinds of equipment. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how I, I, I think there will be new analytical workflows, but maybe they'll be adopted in different places because inherently mm. those companies that have made the investment in, in some of these technologies are, are not going to want to change because they don't want to spend the extra money. Is, is that realistic? Mm. It's just an observation of mine, I guess. Yeah. So anyone else have any other thoughts on you know, how uh, microsampling might influence the future of analytical techniques and technologies? Hi, it's Tim here. I'm, I'm really hoping that it starts to impact on the clinical chemistry analyzers. Um, most of the clinical chem chemistry analyzers we're using um, on day-to-day -day studies are, you know, they're still fairly old-school technology. They still use fairly high volumes. They have incredibly long flow paths using huge volume of sample up. So I'm hoping that, you know, with things like Gyros coming around, you know, we're seeing these almost nano drop technologies being um, accepted into the bioanalytical workflows. I'm hoping that as we move forward, we're going to start more and more of this going into the clinical chemistry as well um, and really see those, those, those um, vendors that make those instrumentations starting to change it. But again, I'm, at the moment, I, there isn't that drive to change, but I'm hoping that that will start to come over the next 10 years as well. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think we're running out of time here, everyone. And also, we, it looks like the other questions we had, um, we've kind of covered in our discussion already. So I'm going to bring it to an end. I think that was a really, really fascinating and interesting discussion. Um, thank you for all your time. And... Uh, 
I'm really excited about where the future might be taking us. Um, bye all now. I would like to thank Neil for hosting today's panel discussion and also to our panelists for their time and insightful discussion. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Remember, you will also shortly find a recording of today's event on www.bioanalysis-zone.com forward slash webinars. I hope you've all enjoyed today's event. Thanks very much for tuning in, and I hope to see you at one of our other upcoming Bioanalysis Zone webinars. Bye for now.